Coming up on today's Airborne, will NTSB Chairman Deborah Hurstman be the next Transportation Secretary? Boeing wants to test fly potential Dreamliner battery repairs, and Felix Baumgartner's record freefall speed has been upgraded to Mach 1.25. I am Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. Well, as we are wrapping up today's episode of Airborne, our newsroom got a late breaking story. Jim Campbell is here to report. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. We've got some late breaking news for you as NTSB Chairman Deborah Herzman has just concluded a press conference identifying the quote, initiating event that led to a battery manufactured by GSE Wasa and its failure aboard a JAL 787 at Boston Logan Field about a month ago. The details are pretty specific and interesting and it shows that the NTSB is making great progress toward identifying both the failure mode of the battery and potential for corrective action in the future. Based upon findings from the examinations and identifying thermal and mechanical damage we believe that the evidence points to a single cell as the initiating event. Let me give a few examples of this evidence. This photo shows a top view of the JAL battery. You can see eight individual cells. While the entire battery suffered damage, it is clear that the left side of the battery exhibits the most thermal damage in cells five through eight. The charring that you see circled in the photo shows remnants of plastic insulating materials. This material charred when temperatures exceeded 500 degrees Fahrenheit. These photos show the side view of the same battery. As you can see, again, greater damage was sustained by the cells on the left side of the battery cells number five through eight. This CT scan of the battery shows that the cells on the left side, again, cells five through eight, experienced significant mechanical damage. Note the deformation of the cells and the bulging of the individual cells. The body of evidence strongly suggests that the event initiated in cell number six, highlighted in red on this slide, Cell number six has multiple signs of short circuiting, which resulted in thermal runaway in this cell. The thermal runaway then cascaded to other cells in the battery, as is evidenced by the damage to those adjacent cells. And that resulted in the fire. Among the names being mentioned to replace Rayla Hood as Secretary of Transportation is NTSB Chair Deborah A.P. Hersman, and some in the know say she is the leading candidate for the post. Hersman, a registered Democrat, was appointed to the NTSB in 2004 by then-President George W. Bush. The Wall Street Journal reports that she has served as a congressional staffer for members of both parties and her nomination could receive broad bipartisan support. Hersman generated some controversy when she convinced the FAA to give the NTSB access to some pilot filed reports about safety issues. Her goal, she said, was to, quote, identify safety issues before they result in fatal accidents, end quote, making the NTSB more proactive on safety and more than just an investigative body. The outgoing chair of the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee, John D. J. Rockefeller, said he would back the nomination of Hersman for the post. There has been no official comment on the speculation from either the NTSB or the White House. It may be the first breakthrough in a return to flight for Boeing's Dreamliners. The plane maker had asked the FAA to allow it to begin conducting test flights with the airplane to evaluate potential fixes for battery issues. Reuters relays a report from the Seattle Times that Boeing had submitted an application to the FAA seeking permission for the test flights. The paper indicated that the FAA was evaluating Boeing's request, and while the agency had not yet set a date for testing to begin, sources say it could be this week. But that could still mean that it might be weeks or months before Dreamliners could begin carrying passengers again. 
When Felix Baumgartner stepped off this capsule into the fringe of space, he began a free fall that eventually reached 843.6 miles per hour, or Mach 1.25. That made him the first human to break the sound barrier without any kind of mechanical assistance. But we already knew that. The Red Bull Stratus team posted new official peer-reviewed results on its website this week. According to the verified data, Baumgartner's speed in free fall increased from 1.24 to 1.25 Mach, but his jump altitude was decreased. Originally reported at 128,100 feet, his jump altitude was lowered to 127,852 feet. While his balloon reached the higher altitude, it descended slightly before he stepped off the front porch. The most important finding of the mission's analysis was already abundantly evident to the countless millions of viewers who watched the leap live around the world. The Austrian adventurer's free fall demonstrated that with the right equipment and proper training, a human being can safely accelerate through the sound barrier. This is a vital breakthrough for the aerospace industry, as it looks for answers to the questions of crew and passenger escape in emergency situations, especially with commercial space travel on the horizon. In the days leading up to the Sebring LSA Expo, Renegade officials were busy acquiring a new 70,000 square foot, $4 million facility at St. Lucie County Airport in Fort Pierce, Florida. The new Renegade facility will now host a full engineering department, a composite and paint shop, along with a full line of LSA avionics department, and a new department that will completely focus on bringing new models and improving existing LSA aircraft or concept aircraft up to meeting conformity standards to the new ASTM and FAA 8130.2G standards. Renegade owner Christopher Doc Bailey said, quote, our plans have always been to bring the top 1% of light sport under one umbrella, to lower costs, and to make a co-op of all American-made, best-of-the-best LSAs. We are positioning the company where potentially new clients will finally be aware that there is a real alternative to Rotax-powered LSAs. We will continue to explore the advantage of a Lycoming-powered aircraft in this rapidly expanding market." End quote. Bailey said that with this new facility, in most cases, Renegade can go from concept to the drawing board, to producing the tooling, to full production, and finally, full certification in as little as 14 months. Flight Design recently completed the first installation of a full ADS-B system in one of its brand new CTLSI models, which are powered by the fuel-injected Rotax 912 IS engine. The newly equipped aircraft made its debut at the 2013 U.S. Sport Aviation Expo in Sebring, Florida. ADS-B equipment for the installation is built by Dynon Avionics, a flight design supply partner that also builds the Skyview Digital Avionics suite used in the CTLSI models. Dynon Avionics says the new SV ADS-B 470 unit offers subscription-free weather displayed on Skyview, including NEXRAD radar, METARs, and TAFs. Airport weather data can be displayed for nearest airports or for a specific airport identifier. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. We're using technology to make this kind of training accessible to all flight schools of all sizes and all budgets, and to democratize flying in general because we make this kind of training more accessible to people. For more information about Redbird Flight Simulations, as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com 
or www.redbirdskyport.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or our podcast, send us an email to news by at aero news.net. A federal grand jury in Medford, Oregon, has handed up indictments accusing two Oregon men of falsifying weight and takeoff power data given to the U.S. Forest Service about helicopters they provided for firefighting missions. One of those aircraft, a Sikorsky S61N, went down in Northern California in 2008, resulting in the fatal injury of nine people on board and four others were seriously injured. Charged are Stephen Metheny, 42, the former vice president of West Coast Operations for Carson Helicopters, and Levi Phillips, who served as maintenance director under Metheny. According to the charging document, the two allegedly knowingly submitted contract bids containing false weight and balance charts and aircraft performance data to the Forest Service. According to a report appearing in the Oregonian, those charts then were passed on to flight crews. The indictment charges Metheny and Phillips with endangering the safety of the helicopters in flight. Information from the NTSB said that the helicopter involved in the 2008 accident was 563 pounds over gross and 1,674 pounds heavier than the pilot's calculations. A conviction carries a possible 20-year sentence. The FAA has released a safety alert for operators directed to owners, operators, repair stations, and mechanics holding airframe and power plant certificates concerning service difficulties and safety issues associated with the Aero Voto Chody L39C and L39ZA variants. According to the agency, air crews have experienced one or more canopies separating from the aircraft or partially opening while in flight. These instances have occurred with a canopy locked indication from the aircraft's annunciator panel warning light. Analyses of these events show a potential for a false indication from the canopy unlock light. The SAFO suggests several inspections and equipment checks to be made at each 100 hours of flight. The FAA says that owners, operators, repair stations, and mechanics that operate and maintain the Aerovoto Chody L39C and L39ZA airplanes should familiarize themselves with the information found in the SAFO and in the Associated Airworthiness Certification Job Aid. It wasn't so long ago that the head of TSA told a group of journalists that the world sees the TSA as the gold standard in airport security. But ANN's editor-in-chief, Jim Campbell, has a slightly different opinion. Having just returned from a trip to Japan, wherein a few gifts for friends there turned up missing from his checked luggage. Here's today's barnstorming commentary. <laughs> As you've heard me say many a time, I'm a patriot. I believe desperately in my country. I believe in everything it stands for. I absolutely love it to its core. Uh, the more I travel the world, the more I appreciate the nature of what being an American has been and should be, but not necessarily what it is at the moment. Um, just got back from a trip to Japan, went through a couple of countries on the way, did business in a number of nations, uh, worked with the security and immigration uh, services for a number of nations as I crossed through. The Japanese were unfailingly professional, courteous, and polite, as they've always been. That's just the nature of the country and the people. Went through Canada, spent a fair amount of time over there, engaged in some tremendously uh, fun and uh, helpful conversations with the immigration and security apparatus in Canada who were unfailingly polite and even cheerful about it. I really felt that they were there to serve and to do so in a, in a positive fashion. TSA uh, on the way out and the way back, surly, nasty, top of their voices, rude to older people, rude to kids, just wanted to get through people as fast as possible and it was pretty obvious that the majority of folks that I saw in that role would have been better off standing behind a counter at McDonald's and asking, you want fries with that? TSA has become an embarrassment. 
And then there's this teeny little thing, and I'm going to bring it up, and it's totally personal. It means nothing in the scheme of things. It just bothers me to the core as an endemic of just the true nature of how cheesy, how vicious, how poorly the TSA um, paradigm has become. I arrive with gifts, or thought I'd arrive with gifts from the U.S., some specialty chocolates that uh, my sweetheart's friends had requested that are easier to get here than they are there. Brought uh, six bags along, arrived to find a TSA notice covering the two that were left in my bag. Four had been lifted. In the scheme of things, it's only $30, $40, $50 worth of stuff. I don't know if I recall what it was. But what it is is this. Petty little thieves rummaging through my bag as they rummage through bags throughout America. Uh, the, the tales of, th of thievery and theft and felonies and so forth are rampant. We can't go a week without another TSA theft, TSA felon, TSA crook story. And it's just become such a downer that it bothers me to the core that a nation as great as America is represented by an organization as fundamentally incompetent as the TSA. It's bad news. Now, I won't tell you that you know anything that happened to me personally means a hill of beans. But it's just one little cog in our great big wheel that says TSA never should have been. And what it is right now needs to be dismantled to its very uh, tiniest uh, parts and rebuilt into something that works. You get rid of the security theater to do its job, to look at what works overseas and around the world and mimic that. Because the TSA not only doesn't work, but it's amateur hour at its worst. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell. And Where's my chocolate? Finally, today on Airborne, in a speech to scientists in Tehran recently, Iranian President Mohammad Ahmadinejad said he stands ready to be the country's first astronaut, seemingly forgetting that an Iranian-born woman and ANN's good friend, Anusha Ansari, has already flown in space and spent several days aboard the ISS. In the speech, the president said, quote, I'm ready to be the first Iranian to sacrifice myself for a country scientist, end quote. But back in 2006, Iranian-born telecommunications entrepreneur Anusha Ansari made a journey to the International Space Station aboard a Soyuz TMA-9 spacecraft, a trip for which she paid some $20 million. Ahmadinejad's statement came after the country reportedly sent a monkey into space last week, though there are some questions as to whether the animal actually survived the trip. The U.S. State Department said that the monkey that appeared in photographs as it was being taken out of the spacecraft appeared to be different than the monkey that was seen in photographs being placed on board the spacecraft. Well, remember you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And please remember Airborne is now streamed twice weekly and is always online. Join us again next Tuesday. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.